I'm Wayne Carey, and this is The Truth Hurts. Well, here we are in a place where I'd like to call my office, but unfortunately, it's probably more the guy I'm about to introduce in the great Jeff Fennick. Jeff, would you consider this place your office? Uh, without doubt, I am. I've spent more time in this place than I am. I've spent anywhere else really in my life. So I um, yeah, always call it the office because um, if I got my work done here and I was happy in this place, um, then I was, I was ready to do what I had to do. Well, and, uh, unlike any other podcast that you've probably done, and I assume you've done plenty of interviews, but I don't want to necessarily talk. We all know how great a box you were. 33 fights, 29 wins. Uh, we know, you know, four-time world champion. Everybody knows that. But I don't think everyone knows your, your, your full story. Obviously, a, a knockabout young kid. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and, and then how you got into boxing. Yeah, well, I was the youngest of six. Um, I was the baby of the family. Um, Does that make you a bit tougher? Uh, now I'm the toughest. <laughs> um, back then, I used to get beat up on my brothers, but um, I don't think they do it anymore. But no, nah, look, um, and uh, like I said, I was uh, brought up in a neighborhood called St. Peter's. It was very close to Maryville. I'm, everybody calls me Maryville Mall because I moved there when I was like 17, but um, I lived in St. Peter's and it was a real rough area. Um, and a lot of indigenous people, a lot of migrants, a lot of Yugoslav people, a lot of um, all different nationalities. And um, we clashed a lot and um, it was, um, everybody wanted to be the best. And um, I, was, I was pretty lucky. Like I said, I had three older brothers and a, a family there. So and we were um, kind of one of the, t- the, the, the tough groups there. We had gangs there and I grew up in in a gang and um most people know or if they know my life story that um as a as a juvenile I was I was locked up in a detention center. and uh, my, my brother and I and um, for um just for common assault we were fighting just in, in gangs like how old were you at that uh, age? thirteen, yeah. Because rugby rugby league was your first love though, wasn't it? Were you oh. playing rugby league at the same time all this was going on? Oh definitely so. Uh, you know as soon as I got home from school there was no homework duck was straight to the park playing football against my mates and we're giving each other the most we could. I always try to, because I was the smallest, I always try to get over everybody and try to uh, show them that I was tougher than everybody else. And that, that's how I grew up. I, like I said, I was so much smaller and people don't realize that um, when I played, like I played um, representative football uh, from um, 14 years old to 18 years old. And um, think of me being 18, playing against 18 year olds. I'm not saying they're a little bit bigger, but I weighed 45, 46 kilo and I played hooker. So I was the, in the middle, in the middle of the field where you had to do most tackling. And that's what I was renowned for. I used to be this little guy who did as many tackles as anybody else, if not more. And um, you know, I was one of these guys who hated to lose and always pushing my mates. I was like, you know, either captain or vice captain of the team all the time. So I was, um, you know, I was somebody who just hated to lose. Do you have any regrets that you didn't follow through with the rugby or, or do you uh, think your race had been run in terms uh, of that? Without doubt. What was I going to do? It forty-eight kilos. I mean, mm. when um, when I played my last year under 18s, um, all well, my friends were go- going to grade. Like I said, um, that was just too small. I still wanted to play. Yeah, with my dream, I was um, keep giving my all. And I went to a youth club one day again. Instead of going to, to play rugby league or to do anything that you do at a youth club, went there to try to find some guys that we wanted to be- wanted to beat up. And and we we searched the downstairs, we searched upstairs, and we grew the wrestling through the. Uh, weightlifting room through oh, every, judo room and the last room was a boxing room and um, I looked through this little window and there's a kid that was in my class at school Wayne and um, his name was Mark Cribb he was a very very renowned boxer but he also played football and I thought I could beat him up so I, that's not what I went there for but I, I went and sat down and watched him train I heard the trainer say that he needed to spar somebody so because I was so cocky and thought I could do that I thought yeah I'll spar him so this man who turned out to be Johnny Lewis said be here tomorrow at a certain time and um, I got there an hour early I was sitting there all excited I'm going to go out there and hopefully uh, beat this Australian champion boxer up but um, it didn't happen like that um, <laughs> it was it was the reverse but as I and it was the craziest thing ever Wayne, because as I left or as it was over this old man the trainer by the name of Johnny Lewis well, he wasn't old then but this man came over and he was older than me he said to me is that the first time you've boxed uh, that was really really good and give me all these compliments I'm thinking shit I've just got the shit beat out of me like I was winded four or five times yet to like pull the opponent up. The yep. guy would beat him up, and I wasn't um, I wasn't impressed with what I'd done. But uh, he was superly impressed. And then he says to me, um, "Would you like to come back tomorrow?" And all my friends are around. I say, of course, I want to come back tomorrow. In my head, I'm saying, "There's no way I'm going back. There. I'm not getting beat up again." <laughs> Wayne, you wouldn't believe it. I went back 
three months later, I was the Australian champion. Wow. New South Wales champion, state champion, and Australian champion. And um, things happened really quick because Johnny said it'll take months and months to um, to get me ready. But um, he let me fight early because he believed in what he's seen. And um, it just happened so, so quick. When you think of that, that was in the middle of um, uh, when I was 17 and a half. So, yeah. I, like, I like to talk about the fake bravado that we as sports people have. Now, I assume I'm talking as a footballer, so team sport. And you put on this mask, you put on this armor that, you know, when you go into battle and some of it is fake, you put it on, fake it until you make it. So they say, but boxing's very different. You're in a ring. There's no escaping. It's one-on-one. -on -one. There's nowhere to go. Obviously you've got your training, as you said, it, it all happened really quickly. And I, and I can understand how you can go from, you know, running away from home or leaving home. And then all of a sudden, you know, being the captain of an AFL club, you talk about, you know, boxing for the first time and then coming back. Not thinking you're going to come back, but then coming back. How quickly, and, and then, and, and is there a mask that boxers wear as well? Is there a fake bravado that you have? Uh, well, let me tell you, the reason why I went back as well was because I, I'd sit in front of my friends and I'd go back, and I didn't want them to think that I was a coward. And thank God that's who I was. That, I was this guy who you know, believed in myself. But again, I, I still never thought anything was going to happen when I went up there because I just thought what happened to me that first day, wow, well, it, it, it didn't feel good. But um, yeah, of course, um, there, there's a lot. Of fakeness in, in, in boxing as well, but um, in boxing, the fake ones always get caught out because it's, it's one on one. So you, you can't hide for too long or you, you can't have that mask on for too long because yeah, it's one on one and, and you'll be found out. Because of your size, do you think that you got in more fights because of that? People actually looked at your physique and, and, and sheer size and just thought, you know what, I reckon I can take this kid. Oh, oh Wayne, listen, when I, <laughs> even when I became, when I was a boxer, I was world champion, I'd you'd hear people in clubs saying, ah. Little, uh, yeah, so yeah, I loved I loved hearing them, especially in the toilets yeah. when I if I was in the cubicle and they were, and I, they, were, they were out the front. I'd walk out and just yeah, they would really quickly change your mind. I mean, like I said, um, um, size doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's a guy with two arms and two legs. That's how I look at it. I, I mean, society has changed a lot, and for the better in terms of how you grew up, how I grew up. Um, and you know, not even, you know, even 15, 20 years ago, I mean, I, you know, being in Wagga Wagga and being in a country town, that's, that's what you did. You went out on a Saturday night you, you got, you ended up in a scuffle outside the front of the pub. That doesn't happen as often these days. If it does, there's something pulled out and we're not advocating obviously violence, but you know, when you were growing up, that was just simply how it was. And, and, but back then it was just simply one-on-one, -on -one, wasn't it? It yeah, was no well, one were pulling weapons or anything like that. It was, no, you, you stood yeah. in front of one another and you had a fight. It was a fist fight. And, and think of this, if you kick somebody, hey, you kick, you're a girl, yeah. you're a yeah. girl. So, and now, now we have MMA where they kick, they choke, they <laughs> strangle you. Know, yeah, but I'm going to it's, um, the world's changed. Yeah, everything's changed. The times have changed and you've got to move with them. So, um, yeah, I mean, like for me, I'm, I was just blessed that, yeah, because I'd never thought of boxing in my life. I never dreamt of being a boxer in my life. I never thought, you know, I've, like I said, I had fights and a lot of times in, in, in fights, you've you got your mates, you, 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 you feel vindicated or you feel like you've got, you got some, yeah, you've got some ammunition with you. So, yeah, so I never ever dreamt of, yeah, looked like being a one-on-one -on -one fight. I mean, I'm not, I'm not scared, I'm saying I've yeah. fought people, but I'm saying um, I never ever dreamt of dreamt being that. a boxer. I never watched any fights. I'm, of course, I heard of Muhammad Ali back in the, in the day, but that was the only thing I ever, ever knew about boxing in them. Um, it just happened so quick for me, Wayne. Like I said, um, three months, six months. And the thing was, and this is the great thing, because, and I know that you met the great Mike Tyson with me. And um, I always used to remember sitting down with Mike and he'd be telling these little stories about him and Customato, how Cus would tell him that he could do these things. Like he'd put these little, set these goals and let Mike know that he could do them. And then Mike would achieve them. Just think, wow, I've done that. Yeah. And that was exactly the same as Johnny Lewis. Johnny Lewis would say to me, if you done the right thing over these next few months, a state title's on, you have the ability to win, I think. Do I really? So I'd done what he said and I won. And then all of a sudden he would tell me that I could be Australian chairman. All of a sudden I won. Then all of a sudden I went overseas and my overseas was getting a, get, getting in a boat from Circle Key to Manly. That was the only <laughs> time I thought I'd be going overseas. So um, it, these things just start happening. And um, the more he told me and the more I achieved, the more I believed, the more I believed in him. And if he told me to jump off the harbour bridge, something great was going to happen to me, I would have done that as well, Wayne. So I'm just, it, like when I, Narrow this down, you know, so just think of this. I start when I'm, you know, 17 and a half. Um, I'm Australian champion. I've traveled the world. I'm fighting guys 
in the World Cup in Rome that are the best fighters in the world from every nation. And I was chosen as Australian, but I had 24 fights. These guys had 200, 300 fights. Mm. And I'm fighting these guys and not winning the, not the whole tournament, but competing with these guys and doing great and winning medals. So I won a bronze medal in the World Cup. And after that was the Olympics. Here's this kid, like I said, that was in a juvenile detention center, had a father. My dad was sick all his life. My dad um, was in a hospital more during every year that I can remember than being at home. I had my mum who was an amazing mum, but worked three jobs. So um, my mum was only there to really cook for us and then um, you know, clean for us. And then she was out working, trying to you know, provide for, for a family of, of six children. And all of a sudden, um, in 84, I get selected to go to the Olympics. My neighborhood was, it was crazy. They were all raising money for me to make sure that I had enough money to enjoy myself and stuff. So um, my life went from being this kid who was totally undisciplined because I, I did a lot of things wrong to, to change it completely around to being the most disciplined 17, 18, 19 year old in the history of sport because I, I never went out again. I never went out with my friends. I, I, I never wiped them. They're always my friends, but they were very, very disappointed because I, I never went and did things that we used to do with them. I was going to say, how, how do you think you handled fame? I, I, like you said, it happened pretty quickly. You went from obscurity to, to uh, not only Australian famous, but uh, world famous. Yeah, to be honest, shit else. Yeah. It, it, it's, 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 there's, there's no, um, well, there was no, there was no script to handling fame and fortune. And I, I don't care who you are, what you want to tell me, fame and fortune changes everybody. I'm talking to somebody who, who would be nodding his head saying, Jeff, yeah. you're, you're 100% right. And I mean, like I said, um, here, here is me. I, I, in Melbourne today already, people patting me on the back, talking to me and stuff. And, you know, I can go to a restaurant, eat for free. I can go to a bar and drink for free. And there, there are people that can't even afford it. And we, and, we, and we don't give it to them. They give it to people who can, can buy their restaurant. I still can't work that out. Why, why so, <laughs> so-called famous people, sports people, has-beens, whatever it may be. You go to a restaurant, you get given everything for free. You get given a car to drive around. You get all of this, and then you've got these people that actually need it. When you don't need it, you, you obviously get it for free. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, so my thing is, just to get back to that question, did I handle it? Um, Yes and no. I, I, I'd like to think that I did all the time, but every time I'd, I'd say I'm still hungry, I'm, I'll never forget where I came from, and I'll never forget where I came from. And, and But you just change automatically. All of a sudden, you can have what you want, you can do what you want, you can be where you want. So um, it's really, really hard to stay the same. And, um, so, yeah, if you ask me how I handle it, yeah, um, I'll tell you the first time that I went to, back to my gym um, after I became world champion, I'll never forget Johnny Lewis. Exact words were, I don't, I don't like to swear because I, I, I don't, but Johnny Lewis said, you see the door you walked in there, son? He said, he said, a couple of years ago, he said, turn around and get that F-U-C-K out of here. And I said, what? And when I walked out, because he kind of threw his voice out. So he saw something as you walked yeah, through he, the door. Yeah, well, he had heard these stories about what I was doing because yeah. when I became world champion and then, I walked outside, duck, and I was crying. I really, I was crying. I'm broken this guy's heart. Without this guy, I'm nobody, you know. So, of course, I went back in, weeping and whatever. And we we spoke, and he told me that he heard some stories about me doing, you know, X, Y, and Z, and, and they were true. I tried to deny them, but um, it was true. And then, um, again, I hit rock bottom. I I thought about it, and you know, you relapse all the time. The more fame I had, the more Fights are won, the more belts are won, the, the worse it got. It's a part of that, it's a part of that fakeness that we, and that facade that we put up and even people that we respect the most and we love the most, whether it might be a wife, partner, it might be our children, we still somehow were able to, you're still able to put this mask up and continue to do what you're doing. But then what people can't understand is you're able to perform when you got in here or you went into the, uh, that's a, almost your sanctuary to escape what you were doing outside of what you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, definitely so. It's a crazy thing that you always think, once I get back in the office, everything's going to be okay. And look, but look, for me, um, when I think about what we just spoke about and how, how, how it changes you, and then you think about when you do get in trouble, and then we still think that we're going to get back out there and we're going to be able to correct everything by being great fighters. But what we don't realize, and that's the thing that, that resonates with me the most is I didn't realize what I'd done to my parents, how, how much damage mentally and stuff I'd 
done to the people around me as, as a father, when I became a father and people said, oh, that's said Jeff Fennick, he's done this. You don't realize. And then um, all of a sudden uh, you, you grow older and you think, well, is there anything I'd like to change? Well, you can't change anything, but I would have changed a lot of things. But like I said, you can't. So what my outlook on life today is, Wayne, is to just try to be a much better person than I was then and try to um, let people know that I made mistakes, be honest, be out there with it and yeah, just be a better person for it. And I, I think I've done that without doubt. I think my life today is um, <clears throat> uh, much, much better. I, I, I'm much more relaxed and happy with the person I am that I look in the mirror today than I, than I was when I boxed because, like I said, if I'm, I go back and think of the guy that was three-time world champion, I, I don't even like the person. I don't like him one bit. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's amazing you say that because that's exactly how yeah, I feel. I don't like him one bit. Well, me. I know, Wayne, I, 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 I've known you for a long time. Yeah. And although I haven't been close to you, I, I can imagine what you went through. And like I said, you're tough. I'm tough, but I'm um, not worried about nobody. But then you sit down and you think, you, you see what it does to your, your mum and dad, your brothers and sisters, your, your, your children when you got them. And shit, it's, it's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible feeling. And nothing can replace it except, like I said, us trying to be better and, 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 and be better people today and try to help people. So you, you, your family and, and your friends and your children say, that's my dad today. And we all make mistakes. And that's me. I've made mistakes. And, and you know, I put my hand up and, you know, like I said, can't go back and, and, and correct them, but I can, I can be a better person today. What, what people don't understand is, and, and because of your upbringing, it's, it's, being that, it's being emotionally mature. And I've, I'm, no, I'm more emotionally mature now. And, and that's exactly what you're talking about. Just, just on that, to, to go back to 91, I reckon it was, where you first met Mike Tyson, because you're on, or you might have met him before, but you're on the undercard to yeah, Mike Tyson. I, I'd met him, man. I'd met him. You met him prior to that. that. Yeah. yeah. But um, I mean, that, that, and some of the people you've met, obviously, Mike, who you introduced me to, which we spoke about on this podcast a while ago, I had the photo. I don't know whether you remember how nervous I, I was. Remember. Of course uh, I remember. But when I was getting the photo of him. Especially, but was, especially when you were telling me before that you could uh, knock him out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just thought I was a little bit bigger than him. But uh, that's uh, just part of the pun. But no, he, he um, that was a great thrill. But you, so you've met guys like Iron Mike. What about some of the other people? I noticed you rubbing shoulders just recently with, I'm not putting him in Mike Tyson's category, by the way, by Kyle Sandiland's wedding. You're talking to the Prime Minister. At the wedding, you're just rubbing shoulders with some pretty big names. Yeah, I wanted the Prime Minister to know that when it comes to Maryville, because he's from Maryville, there's three, there's me and my retarded friend, Con, and then there's the Prime Minister who's done great as well. Great man. I, I was amazing meeting him, but I, I'll tell you a, a great little story. Um, I was at a restaurant in, in LA and Al Pacino was there and um, I wanted to meet him, you know, and um, so I asked the owner, who's a, gr a good friend of mine who earlier got some gloves signed for me and all this kind of stuff, and um, I said, do you mind if I go and meet Al Pacino? He says, um, Jeff, listen, we don't do that in this restaurant. We don't let people get restaurants or we don't get photos. I feel like saying, well, you just got on with me, you know, because this guy just photo. Anyway, but I understood totally, you know, but I was, I was really, I'm there looking and looking. And after a couple of little stairs, he was looking at me and I'm thinking, oh, well, you know. Anyway, I got up to leave the restaurant and, my, and, we're, and we're just walking out and um, he says, champ, sit down beside me. So I sat beside him. It was amazing. I went and got the gloves from the owner of the restaurant. I gave him to Al Pacino. And um, we had a great talk and he was telling me that he's going to put these gloves in a, you know, a place in his home that he'll cherish and that kind of stuff. Really nice. And all of a sudden in the morning, I get a call from my wife. She says, Jeff, where were you last night? I said, why? So we just got an email from Al Pacino saying how delighted he was to see you and your gloves are in his bar at home. And he was really surprised. So that, man, that really made me um, feel on top of the world that I'm walking out of a restaurant on Al Pacino, you who I was. So that, yeah. was, that was great. But like I said, I met um, De Niro and, I was blessed enough to meet LeBron James and I was maybe even more blessed to, to travel the world with Kerry Packer and to see, um, wow, what a, mm. what a different world it is when you're, yeah, you know, when you're Kerry Packer and when, what a different world is when you're Mike Tyson. I remember being in London with Mike and if Mike could move the blinds in his, in his room, these people downstairs, we'd go and scream and it was just crazy. We'd get in the car and because of the traffic in London, people would walk or run for kilometers just touching the car to meet Mike. It was crazy. I've been blessed. Who, who was your hero growing up? Um, my hero growing up would have been Ray Price and Peter Sterling, rugby league oh, yeah. players. Yep. And I never really um, followed the sport of boxing, but when I got involved in boxing, of course, I loved Mike and Roberto Joanne. They're my um, two favorite fighters uh, and my great friends in the sport of boxing. But yeah, yeah, when I think of the sport of boxing, I think of Joe Lewis as an amazing, maybe the greatest heavyweight that I believe of all time. And I think Ray Leonard and Roberto Joanne were just amazing competitors. So yeah, I'm, I'm just blessed. And like I said, um, I've got all these beautiful belts at home, but the belts mean nothing to me. If somebody asks me to, to donate them for a, a charity or something, I'm, I'm sure that I would give them away with them. 
when when you know you've made it in any sport is when your peers respect you. And um, when I get off a plane and I go to a convention or something to get the the cutest and the applause and the, and the love that I get from the Roberto Joans, the Tysons, the Lennox Lewis, and all those guys, you know, the Benny Pazzas, and they, then I know I've made it in the sport. Well, I've I've seen you in a room. I see that when you walk into a room, you've just mentioned some amazing people that all have uh, a presence. What I love about you when you walk into a room, and as you said, you're not a big you're not a big guy, but you have an amazing presence, and I and and you feel the love. You 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 catch cry when you I love you all, which became famous, come a part of our language here in Australia. Love you all, and and you you're known for that. But that's how you carry yourself when you come into a room, and everyone everyone feels that. Yeah, I like to feel. Today, when I walk into a room, I walk into a room thinking that, yeah, I'm. I'm here for a reason. I'm here to, yeah. And most times I'm, I'm at places I'm either talking or doing something or trying to help somebody. I kind of, I feel much better walking to a room at this age than I did um, when I was, you know, in my 20s. And, and the truth of the matter is that, as you know, I just got my fourth world title and I think I got it at exactly the right time. Had I got it back then, duck, I doubt if I'd be here now. I doubt um, if I'd be, I'd, Positive, I wouldn't be married to my beautiful wife that I'm married to today. And um, I said, everything happens for a reason. So I think um, whoever was watching over me above made sure that um, I got the world title at the right time. And um, yeah, it's very fitting that uh, you can hear someone in the background hitting a speedball there. So we're obviously. It's, and that's another gym. crazy thing. I've never hit one in my life. You've I've never hit a speedball. I've never done a round in my life on the speedball. Well, I, I, I think, I think there's, there's plenty of people out there. We've, we've been in enough gyms. You've been in more than me, but. Generally, some people that hit the speedball can't generally do, it, do what's uh, required in here. Would you oh, agree with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of that. Again, it's all about show and <laughs> it looks the good. fakeness. It yeah, looks yeah. Good. A lot of those guys that do that, feel that they can't go and get punched in the face. That's for sure. I, I, I love that. And, and so you'd agree, it's not how you throw a punch, it's how you take a punch? Well, it's… Uh, Were you a technique? Do you think you were a technically great fighter? Oh, without doubt. You've got… Listen, had a great well, jaw. Well, then on top of that, you, if you… Like I said, I, I tell people today, if you're not smart outside the ring, you're not going to be smart inside the ring. You've got to have, you've got to have, you've got to have smarts. And I was, and I was, Kerry Pack used to say, if you, you know, Jeff Fenney could run the country because you always knew how smart I was, you know. Well, can you go and sort this bloke out that's on the speedball back there then? Yeah, uh, sure somebody could if you just tell him that. <laughs> He's, uh, so, so these days, I see you've got Team Fenney. I know, obviously, uh, you've got some uh, you've got some uh, boxers that you look after. You're still in contact with uh, Tyson overseas, and still heavily involved in the sport. You're in Melbourne, so tell us uh, what what you're doing here. Yeah, I'm here. Um, obviously, I work for Fox Sports. I work from our main events. So I'm working for Fox, and um, thanks to Steve Crawley and the team there, and Ben Damon, who's an amazing co-host of mine. And we we um, we call the fights. I love it. I am. Um, I love trying to be real. I don't try to sugarcoat things. If somebody makes a mistake, I'll say it's a mistake. If somebody's good, I'll say it's good. If somebody wins the fight, I'll say they win. If I think they lose, I'm going to say they lose. You know, and I've, um, I've been criticized by a lot of fighters after the fight saying, oh, you're my friend. You must have listened. What do you want me to tell you? One way you didn't. So it's pretty black or white for me. Is that given that this, uh, this, this is the truth hurts, do you think boxing has been hurt by the fact that, you know, people, especially, especially judges in boxing, there's just been so many controversial decisions around boxing that it has damaged the sport in some way. Oh, without doubt. Listen, this is boxing is a sport here. Look at this. So the guy that referees here and the guys that judge, they can do the worst job ever, but next week they work again. If, you, if your yeah. podcast is shit, brother, you're <laughs> out of here. There's no more podcasts. If I can't, yeah, I'm, if you can't hold a train, go and, and serve people, you get the sack. These guys do it every week. And let me just tell you, the judge who, Judge the Lomachenko fight in Haney that gave the, the fight to Haney by four rounds. I thought Haney might have just, well, that's my opinion. But the, the guy who gave him by four rounds was the guy who robbed me against Jim Nelson. It was exactly the same judge. Wow. And he's still, still doing working. it today. He's still doing it today. So. How, old, how old is he? Uh, he I'm a, 106. <laughs> that's insane. And, and that's the other thing, Duck. I mean, some of these guys can't even walk to, the, to their chairs and sit down. So I don't know how they can see or, or how they can judge. And, and the biggest thing is they've never been punched in the mouth on their own. No, I mean, they deserve to be punched in the mouth. They need to be punched in the mouth, especially after that fight as well. But yeah, they've, they've got, unless you've been in there and done that, it's, it's, it's a hard job. Well, given the uh, given the noise, I know it looks like the speedball's finished in the background. I was going to say, given the noise, we might uh, we might wind it up. What I was going to say, and we we uh, did a bit of a podcast yesterday, and I was standing in here earlier, and I had this shirt on which says "athlete," and uh, someone yelled out, "They said athlete," and I turned around. So see the the black eye. Uh, Jeff did that. That's uh, that's now that's now part of how I got the black eye. It's the great 
Jeff Fennick gave me a clip. Uh, right, I'd, like gonna... to, I'd like to say it was me. Don't look at that. Just have the credit for doing that. No, no. Nah. But no, like I said, um, you know, Duck, I wanted to be sitting with you on it. And I know the rides you've been through. And I know the, the shit you've been through. And I know how you must feel because I've been there, brother. And I am totally with you 100%. Hey, um, we all make mistakes. What, what, what doesn't uh, kill you only yeah, makes you and, stronger. And listen, mate, I, I tell everybody this. We all make mistakes. I've, I've written references for people. I, I try to say to people, listen, hey, to these to these judges and stuff, I say, put your son in that position. When I write to them, I say, put your son in that position. Wouldn't you like your son to get a second chance? Yeah, we all deserve a second chance. And listen, and, 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 and who cares if it's a second or a third chance? People deserve a chance. And if people are willing to, to, to work hard and show you they're going to change, they deserve the chance to to, to, to do that, to Mate, do that. You're an absolute superstar. Um, obviously, your boxing uh, um, speaks for itself. We know what you did there, but I think, and as you say, and this is what we, I love about what we're doing here and the interviews that uh, I'll be doing, and that is people that have come from, obviously, rough upbringings, or not even rough, but have succeeded and then fallen and then come back through the other side, and, and, and clearly you sit better and more comfortable in your own skin now than you ever have, well, which that, I think is awesome. I'm going to give somebody an opportunity because, you know, back in the day there was that, that there was that movie with that lady when how did you become so rich? What was that lady's name? She's a blonde lady. She's passed away now. God bless her soul. She's a beautiful. And she, you know, and she'd go up to the people. Listen, we we need to do a podcast. We need to do a, a series on how did you become so poor? Because so, so many rich people that have been poor, and these people that live in the streets have had money and. That's the, that's the message that we need to, to get across to kids at school. Have a look at these people that have got nothing and why they've got nothing. That's, don't worry about how people got rich. You know, just look at how people got poor and that's going to that's gonna make you become rich, you know. So I've always yeah. wanted to do something and, and go and talk to people about the situations they're in and, and how they got there. And, and there's an opportunity if you want to change it because if you want to change it, we, we can change. We can all change. We can all Get up and wash ourselves. We can all, you know, yeah, with a little bit, of, with a little bit of help and a little bit of support, we we can do that. Not, yeah, you know, I've always said I'd love to do a, uh, not just a podcast. I'd, I'd love to do a thing where you you go and see a lot. In my sport in the boxing industry, and there are so many people who had millions and millions and millions that have got nothing today. And I, you know, I'd love to go and ask them why and why that happened. You know, well, I've got the right uh, producers and the right team here to uh, to to start that. Does it sound but, good? How did but, I become so poor? I, uh, you know what, Jeff. You are a champion. Hey, Duck. And you are a legend. I'm your so friend thank forever, you very brother. Much. I just know that. Good on you, mate. Thank you. Thank you.